So this is how I want to frame the talk today. I think there's a lot of discussions um, in, in various, you know, LinkedIn or other forums about this concept of psychological safety. And for some background, Google did a, a study where they discovered that of all the predictors of team success was that the, the best predictor was this concept of psychological safety, which is very broadly the ability to get real as a team, be diverse, speak your mind, um, diversity of opinions, the ability to get real is probably the best way to describe it. And the topic for very briefly for the talk today, and I'd love to have some discussion about it if we have time, is that I think that as product uh, professionals, we have an incredible opportunity due, due to the awkward relationships we have with the team. So what I mean is that because we sit in this sort of messy, nebulous part of the organization in many cases, I see this as an opportunity to assist in creating psychological safety for our teams. And I think about these stories from my past and I think about all the opportunities that the that as a, as a product development team, we could have moved that to a better place. And the reason why I think it's important is, and especially I was hearing this in the last talk, in the, in the brief part that I caught there at the end, is that so many of these methods and tools and uh, approaches, modern approaches to product development require psychological safety. It requires people to be able to get real in the room together and build shared understanding. And if you think about all the process we sometimes create as product managers uh, and think about how many of them are based on a lack of trust, for example, or a lack of safety, and then you think about the good stuff we want to spend our time on, the activities we want to spend our time on, talking about outcomes, talking about experiments, talking about our... Um, openness to failure, all of these things require psychological safety. So on one hand, you have very almost toxic process that exists because no one is willing to speak out. And as product people, we need to wade through that process to get to the good stuff and to get to the things that are going to really move our products forward. And I, I think hopefully that frames kind of where I'm going in the particular talk. I want to talk about the opportunity we have as product professionals. Um, and, it, you know, in parts of this talk, it's going to get a little real, and I'm going to be talking about awkward situations, but just as a heads up. Right? So the first thing I think it's important to talk about is, and I've only just now in my career fully begun to accept this in myself, is the immense pressure we are under as product managers. We're expected to have the answers. We're expected to be decisive. We're expected to be multitaskers. We're expected to connect all the dots. We're expected to drink our coffee. We're expected to influence our organizations. We're expected to have all the data, to think faster than anyone else, to have the perfect roadmap or the perfect presentation, to be able to talk to anyone in the organization. And it's amazing to me when I think about this, but I'm 42 years old and only in the last two years have I begun to accept the immense amount of pressure that I have been placing on myself as a product professional or product development you know, player. And I had always internalized all that pressure as my vision of what the perfect product owner or the perfect product manager was. And even if I had had an experience as a UX researcher where I was able to gaze at the product person and say to myself, geez, I'm empathetic. That person looks like they're about to lose, like lose their mind. When I came back into the role of product, I couldn't see that in myself. So I think that I wanted to start this concept of psychological safety with also really looking inwards at the pressures that we're under as product managers. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know, maybe a quick show of hands. Has anyone heard the idea of being the mini CEO of your product? Okay. Um, has anyone been told with, you know, three hours to go that your board was expecting a roadmap and then the CEO of the company comes in from their little airplane and then asks you to produce a roadmap? You have three hours to do it and freak out. Has anyone been in that position? 
Okay, not, okay, good. Some people have been, I, that is the scary one for me. Or has anyone felt like they're in a position where they're having so much energy and competing energies in the room that you literally feel like you want to scream, but as a product person, you're supposed to keep a straight face. Has anyone felt that particular sensation? All right, great. All right, so you know what I'm talking about. I think that we, we, we have some shared understanding there. So that's the first thing. What pressures are we under as product professionals? And the second area there is to think deeply about how we are rewarded. And I think that that is actually a related topic here in the sense that we are rewarded for having the bold idea. We're rewarded for getting shit done. We're rewarded for shipping at all costs. We're rewarded for having the answers in our organizations. So when we think about if, if anyone's in a product leadership position in the audience, we often overlook that it's such a culture of product management that these words like get shit done or ship it or, you know, drive <laughs> sense are all these words, how aggressive some of these words are <laughs> and the type of thing that we're getting involved in and how we might be rewarding our fellow product managers um, and start thinking about psychological safety, you start to get to some interesting um, considerations for yourself. Because I found that myself, I would go a month or two and say, you know, I'm kicking ass at my job. But then I thought, well, am I kicking ass at my job? What, why, why am I kicking ass? And I realized a lot of it was from external images in the organization about what product is supposed to do. I was being rewarded for driving my ideas through. I was being rewarded for shipping and making the particular deadline, even if maybe it wasn't the best time to ship the product at that point. Um, and I was rewarded for having the answer. So I frequently ask this question to product folks, you know, how many people have killed a feature in the last three or six months? Literally pulled something out of production because it doesn't work. And we don't need to go through that exercise again here, but often when I spoke in Hamburg uh, at Mind the Product, I think I asked and it was 300 people and maybe six people raised their hands. So out of 300 people, only six people raised their hand and said, I made a mistake. It didn't work the way I thought it would work and we had to take some action. So again, to sum up this part, so first we talked about pressures we're under as product managers, but then the next is how are we rewarded as product managers? So I think this is a really important thing to think about in your organization. So pulling rewards and pulling pressures together, let's think about how the messages that we send to our teams. And these questions are uncomfortable even when I ask myself these questions because I realize how hard it is to do this as a busy product person. So one message is, are we present in the moment and are we receptive? Meaning we're communicating with our team and are we truly present in that space, listening to the words that people are saying to us and thinking about them? not thinking about the next meeting, not waiting the 35 minute meeting just till someone says it's gonna be done in one week instead of three weeks, not being bored, not tapping on our, our Slack or anything, but are we present in the moment and being receptive to our teams? And so I took a quick analysis of my last three days here at Zendesk and I would say that maybe I get a B minus at you know uh, this week but I grade myself on this often and it's a great week when it can be an A, but I need to be honest with myself that sometimes it's a B minus. So that's one question. Are we present in the moment and are we being receptive? The second question, which is a painful question for a lot of people is, especially because I think humans want to be part of a social group is, are you a member of the team or are you an intruder on your team? And I think every product person has had that feeling and it causes a fair amount of tension. You spend time with the team and then you're in another meeting and people are talking about your team, saying maybe, hey, what's taking them so long? Or you get privileged information from the organization about maybe a new initiative and someone says, shh, don't tell anyone. This might make everyone, this might freak everyone out. And 
I think that's very hard. And what I came to accept with myself is that I really need to feel a belonging with a team. I want to feel like a member on my team. And I don't want to feel like an intruder on my team. And I think that intruder may be a harsh word, but let's just take some other words, you know, a conductor or a manager or an owner of that particular team. A lot of these words don't suggest you are a member of the team. And I have asked at Mind the Product, we have Mind the Product here in San Francisco, and as a point, I started to ask every person I talked to, are you a member of your team? Do you sit shoulder to shoulder with people on your team? Or do you feel a little awkward about your relationship with the team? And I spoke with about maybe 60 people, 65 people, and I would say that only 20% of them, around 20%, felt truly as a member of their team and that they felt safe enough to discuss their own needs on their team. And I think that this is a very important thing we need to consider in the product community. So we have, are you present in the moment? Are you a member of the team or are you intruder? And I think that the final question is, are, is, is the environment safe enough for people to push back on you? Meaning, when there is disconfirming information that the team is bubbling up to you, how do you respond to that information? Do you bite your lip? Do you start typing in Slack furiously because it's a very uncomfortable thing? Do you say something like, um, I, I had this great product person I worked with who'd always say, oh my, that's curious all the time, which was a very funny phrase. So an engineer would say, I don't think that's going to work. And the product person was one of these, I, lo I love this guy, but he was one of those who could keep an absolutely straight face all the time, no matter what was happening. And then they would say, that's curious. And that's it. But the funny part is, is that when, you know, the meeting was over, <laughs> the engineer would come up to me and say, what does that mean? What the hell does I'm curious mean? <laughs> right? So when I would talk to this product person, he'd say, oh, that's a terrible fucking idea. Right? So you, I don't think that situation was a very safe situation. And what that product person thought was the right way to respond in that situation, the sort of stoic leader influencer way to respond was completely transparent to any smart person in the room. And I think that that's very important. So are we present? Are we a member of our team? And is the are we making the environment open to discuss pain or challenges in the team? And then I think that the last one is absolutely vital is, do we find that the team is a safe place to express our needs to the team? For example, team, I'm getting a lot of pressure from the rest of the organization to have a little bit more certainty around what we're trying to do here. And I'm not getting that from you guys. You need to help me in this situation. Now, think about the difference of saying that versus saying, okay, team, time to do the estimates again. Thank you. You know, the reality with estimates is a lot of times they're very unnecessary, right, for certain types of things that you're doing. So you can see the difference there or expressing the need of team. I'm having a really hard time here. I'm, I don't have the data I need to make a decision. And that is making me very uncomfortable. And I'm feeling a little bit out of my league here is extremely different than saying, oh, team, have you followed up on the 12 user stories around the dashboard that I asked you about five weeks ago? And you have a million other things to do, but I'm going to keep bugging you about the dashboard. Notice the difference there, right? One is expressing your needs as a product person, and then the other is uh, creating some kind of proxy way to have that discussion. And I think as product folks, we do this all the time. In fact, a lot of the process, especially around Agile, around Scrum, is almost designed to not have the real conversation about what you're going to do. Um, I'm going to give you some examples of these and maybe hopefully it will make you laugh if you've been in this situation. But so just to wrap up that thought, what messages do we send? Are we present? 
Are we a member? Do we make it safe for people to challenge us? And are we expressing our needs in the situation? So maybe, hopefully this will be sort of more fun. But you know, here's some real world examples of this. And I think these are always funny stories. These are all stories from my, um, my particular career. So I worked with a junior product manager um, who had read certain books. So they were the mini CEO of the product. Um, they would watch Steve Jobs on, on, on YouTube every day. Uh, they thought they knew everything about how to function in this situation. They were the mini CEO. And they, every meeting they were in, they were trying to be so stoic about their approach with everything. And, oh, actually, this story is not funny because this person got burnt out and they left product management. So, yeah, that's not so funny. But the funny moment was is that she took a wonderful vacation after burning out as a product manager where she really started to express her needs to work with other people and then found out that, that really deep inside she wanted to become a service designer because she felt that was more hands-on with the team. But, but the, the, the story there was this person looked around and, and looked at models of people. Steve Jobs is a good example. If you've read books about Steve Jobs, he was also an asshole, right? He was a brilliant asshole. And so, and he did get the best out of people sometimes, right? So you had a junior person who had never shipped code to production, working with senior engineers, acting in this very stoic way, and they internalized so much of the pressures that they were under that they burnt out. And I think burnout is a, is a major problem. So that's not such a funny story, but that's a cautionary story. This one is pretty funny. This one is funny. Is that I remember talking to a product person and they were saying, oh, my, my team's moving slow. Okay. Um, tell me more about it. Well, they, we said that they could do 120 story points uh, every two weeks, but they only do 60. Oh. May, uh, well, maybe you should just commit to doing 60 story points every two weeks. Or may, maybe you should do one week sprints, or maybe you should do one day sprints. It sounds like maybe there's something going on. Oh, no, no, but if, if we lowered it to 60, then they would get 30 done. Huh. So w what's going on? Or do you trust the team? And then that's when it, it, it starts to get serious, right? This is, the game, this is the belief that other people are gaming the system, which then creates an unsafe process because – this product person worked with their scrum master to keep 120 story points. The team was only getting 60 done. And the concern was is that they would get 30 done if they lowered the thing to 60, right? So this is an example. But the, the, the funny part was how long this game went on before an engineer stepped up and just called everyone out. And the, air, the way that they, all the tension was relieved in the room the minute that the engineer felt safe enough to speak out. So there was a happy ending to that particular story. Um, hopefully these examples are helpful. Um, the other example of this often that I see with PMs is this idea of protecting the team. And there's a phrase, shit umbrella. And the idea is that you're going to protect your team from all the shit in the organization so that they can... Uh, exist comfortably. Now think about that for a second. The motivation there is safety. You're actually, the motivation is safety, but you're creating a void there between the team and the business that has a lot of potentially valuable information. And the funny part there was that on the, the team had one remote person and the remote person shared the um, you know, video conferencing link with a key business stakeholder at that point. And the meeting was happening and everyone was talking and guessing about these things. And this wonderful thing happened. The, the stakeholder who worked in marketing that the product person had felt it was their responsibility to protect the team against, jumps into the standup and says, you know, uh, this is Raul, and I'm in marketing. I, I'm so grateful that the team is taking this on. Um, I want to clarify some information for the team. 
And literally in about 35 seconds, this person presented such a good summary of the problem that the engineers after that particular call were able to, to sort of cut the, the effort by 75% because they said, you know, we can solve that problem in another way. And so the product person, this was a little tough for them. They felt a lot of loss of control in that particular situation. But it was an amazing thing to watch because once you brought the business together with the team and started to create a safe environment, things began to unfold and it was exciting. So before having maybe some discussion, and I'm not sure how I can participate in much in the discussion, maybe it can be more between everyone in the room, but the question then is what do we do? How do we try to fix this particular problem? And I, I have a couple points here, and I, I've seen this work, but I think more, you know, you probably have better ideas than I do um, overall. But I think the first point here is you need to resolve your own tension with being a product manager. And that's a heavy thing to think about, but you need to ask yourself about your journey and your needs to being involved in this crazy world that we call sort of product development. Because what I find when I talk to product managers sort of around the world at this point is that deep inside there's this tension about what they want out of the situation and that manifests to the team as a level of discomfort from the product owner and, and can contribute to an unsafe environment or an environment that's not very, you know, open to experimentation. Once you decide that, you need to be very clear with yourself about whether you consider yourself and want to be a member of a team or you want to manage and float above a team. I don't have a value judgment on whether one of those is right or one of those is wrong. But when people, after doing this for decades now at the moment, when people try to do both is when they get into trouble. And I think that that's very, very important to think about is that the more the product person that you're caught in the middle, the more that that energy gets relayed out to the rest of the team and the more uncomfortable that they get. So that's the second one. The third one, back to what we talked about earlier, is set yourself a challenge every day to say, I don't know five times. Get uncomfortable and in the process, get comfortable with not having to have every answer for every person for every single meeting. And that is it. It's been a huge step for me personally. I, I am very um, methodical with some of these challenges. And so I've gone now 14 days saying I don't know five times a day. And I haven't said it yet today. I might lose my streak by the end of today. So that would be one item. The other thing is I think that a lot of product folks don't keep journals. I don't know if any UX people are there in the audience or designers. A lot of UX folks and designers keep journals about their day at work with sketches and drawings and ideas. And I think that I've found personally that journaling about your challenges as a product person on a daily basis can really let you reflect on whether you were a participant in an unsafe situation and how you could have made those situations more safe. I think that the um, one thing that is very, very challenging in this environment is that making work visible or pulling the wool off of the messiness that's product development is one of the most valuable things we can do, but it's also one of the most tense things to do. And what by, I mean by that is, let's say that your team is working 50% of their time on some technical debt or some support. I always remember a CTO saying to me, I don't want to put that on the roadmap because if I do, the CEO is going to come and it's going to take all those items out. And I said, well, uh, how, do we, how can we reflect on the hardships that you guys are under? The CTO said, that's a topic for another day. Right now, I'd prefer to keep this hidden. Three days later, the CEO comes in and says, why are we going so slow? And that to me is the perfect example of safety in that situation. But I think as product people, we can be more encouraging to our teams to help expose the invisible work that they're working on and create a safe space for them. 
for example, the team is creating a lot of technical debt items, try to raise those items up without judging them or without trying to, to micromanage those particular items. That's an example about making work visible. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. It's a very simple concept, which is as product people, we have an incredible opportunity because of where we swim in our organizations. And we have an incredible opportunity to promote psychological safety, the ability to fail gracefully, the ability to let teams take risks. And I want to encourage people uh, to, I know this is a heavy topic, but I want to encourage people to go through their next week thinking, how can I make my environment safer? Because once you do that, all the advanced methods that you can read about, all the lean startup methods, all the design thinking methods, all the beautiful cross-functional team methods, all of those methods become possible. Until there's psychological safety in those environments, you will always feel like you're battling this elephant in the room. And it won't, you won't be able to discover all these awesome things that you're doing. So I wanted to you know, end with that and see if anyone has any questions or maybe even you guys can have a discussion among yourselves about the topic. Thanks. Hi, John. Can you see the audience? Um, I can see people from the side. I'm seeing people's yeah. backs, but I see some. I can see you just fine. Okay. okay. So, questions, please, for, for John. It's not a question, it's more a remark. Uh, your example with the team, so the PO asking the team for estimation. I think that's a pretty common pattern you see in organizations that uh, teams are doing cargo cult. So, they just do estimations because we do estimations in Scrum. And they don't question why the hell are we doing estimations. I right. see this many, many times. They just do it and, hey, let's have estimation. Let's spend one hour talking about stuff and put numbers on it. And yep. maybe, that, maybe that's a, it's a common topic. I see it everywhere. Maybe. Yeah, so let's try, to I would say let's try to tie that to the safety discussion, which is when estimates are a proxy for trust, you have a problem. Because you're hiring estimates to to do a job which estimates are not the best thing to do the job for. And so I would say that maybe in the last four years, I have not had any team estimate a story that I've worked on. I don't work like that, and a lot of teams I know don't work like that. We sure as hell have a lot of discussions about stories, but you don't need to hire an estimate to trigger a discussion with your team. I personally do like epic level estimates, but even then, they're just literally the, the five-second discussion with, with a tech lead. And it's mostly for me to do cost of delay analysis for prioritization. It has nothing to do with dependency management. So that's a great example around estimates is that when you're using estimates as a proxy for safety or trust, you have to keep your ears open and know that that's what you're doing. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to say thanks first, John. It was really nice and, and great. And I have one remark and one question, and maybe you can answer I don't know to the question and keep you straight somehow. Um, so I, I went through an experience um, through the last half year maybe where I also had a couple of situations where for the first time I was kind of standing in front of my te team and saying, um, I don't know. I, I don't have the question to this answer right now. Or, guys, girls, folks, I'm really struggling with this right now. And um, can you help me? And it was really, really relieving and beautiful because um, there was kind of a process happening where I felt I could call for the team on support that are maybe even like sometimes core PO topics. And they were like supportive. Maybe in the beginning, not so much, but then more and more. And so that was a really great experience, and yeah, I just wanted to underline that. And and then um, I have a question because I'm, there's something I'm still struggling with. Um, I I also had this concept in my head of like shielding the team from outside pressure, um, or maybe shielding the team from a stakeholder because I felt like if there's a direct connection and there's not enough context, maybe on the side of the stakeholder, then things get messy, and I had this like 
fear of losing control of the situation somehow. And I think I'm doing these things less. And I'm also like saying to the team, look, there's a lot of pressure on me or on us for these reasons or going on the meta level and saying, I'm, I'm asking this because this is happening. Um, but I still have this reflex and sometimes I'm not sure if I do try to shield the team out of reflex and out of this fear of losing control or if it actually makes sense in a given situation because it would create a, a, a smoother process. So, I don't know. Yeah. Do, do you have well, I think that on, on how to make this judgment call other than just being present and questioning it? So, so I think that one interesting way to... The first thing that comes to mind is that I would probably say to my team, um, team, I'm concerned about this discussion. I want to provide this context for you. And I think that this person has valuable information, but I'm concerned that, that to build a shared understanding we need to have a, a fruitful discussion as a team could really require an investment from everyone here. Right? And that is a powerful thing to say because the team might say, you know what, we're really busy. <laughs> like, this has been my lesson for the last two weeks, and I've kept saying it. Shared understanding is expensive and it's an investment. There's no silver bullet. There's absolutely no silver bullet. You can be in a meeting with someone for two hours and walk away and still only have 5% shared understanding. The reason why you have a room set up like you do today and the activities today is because shared understanding is work all the time. So I have a, a, a specific answer to your question. I have a teammate here at Zendesk who dedicates one hour for every new stakeholder who's going to be in a meeting with the team to understand their motivations and try to understand where they're coming from. And it's just work. So the thing I would answer to your question is, is invite the team into your thought process instead of shielding them because they may want you to shield them. They may say, you know what? We want you to wear the shit umbrella hat this week. Please wear that hat. And then when you don't need to wear that hat, you can take that hat off versus not telling them when you're wearing that hat or not. And then the other part of it is um, shared understanding is hard work. It's not free, <laughs> right? So you have to schedule your time. And a great thing here with product people, I forgot to mention this in the talk is, it's all about time management. And if you don't dedicate an hour or two hours a day to, to the deeper thought of being a product person, I'm going to be very transparent here. I think I, I have burnt out in the past because I take my thinking home with me. You know, I leave work and that's when my deep thinking about being a product manager takes place. And so I think that scheduling and blocking an hour or two each day to, to take out your journal and to think about these tensions and to do that hard work of shared understanding. If you're not doing the work and you're running around because you're meeting, I wish I could show you my meeting calendar. I'm sure it's like your guys' meeting calendar. You're never going to get the shared understanding done. So schedule time for it. Thanks. Thank you. I don't know what this, what's your schedule, uh, John. Um, I think. I, 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 gave the, uh, I gave the snake sign to the people trying to use the room and they left. Uh -huh. so, um, so maybe, so maybe I, I asked them for forgiveness. <laughs> so I think I have about 10 more minutes and then I'll have to have the other, I'll have to have the next snake sign. Okay. Anyone? Please show the question. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm experienced the problem of balancing for, for the devs. I mean, it's super cool to integrate them, to make them safe space so that they can speak out loud because in the end for most of the products they are also users. So why not ask them also how they feel about something? But at some point, I always experienced that they um, did not like the feature or something, which is okay, but that they started to not like anything at all. Because mm -hmm. maybe they miss the user testing, they miss the benchmarking, they don't have the whole spectrum why and what and how to do, which is fine because they are tests. Um, but that they are basically so research focused on themselves that they start to decline everything in every planning meeting. So do you have any tips on how I think it's lost? <laughs> can you guys hear me? Yes, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you guys. So maybe the video is just stuck. Yeah. Okay. 
So do you have any tips for, for how to balance that? Yeah, so let me try to say it back because I know I think I know exactly what you mean. And I've I've actually been experiencing that even in the last maybe month or so, where you at some point shared understanding is lost, or at some point there's just different opinions on things, right? There's just there's some issue where you try very hard to get people to understand the context, but that there's just some tension that can't get resolved. I, I'm not sure if that's a correct way to say it. And then the idea why it might be like, what are some tips to, to do that? So I think that Jurgen Apello does some very interesting things in his books on the sort of management 3.0. Um, he has a beautiful book called Work Games, or he has other things, which is, I th oh, oh I, I think I have an answer for you that I've been thinking about, which is similar to what Jurgen Apello would say. Which is that one thing I've, I notice is that when teams believe that they will never be able to revisit a, situ a situation or a decision, or when things are moving so slowly in an organization that people are terrified, they're going through like old legacy code from five years ago, right? They're, they feel that they will never be able to fail at a decision. I've noticed that that's one of the things that encourages this type of tension in the room when you're getting closer to wanting to ship something. And, and you can't seem to get consensus. There's this energy in the room where people are scared and worried and questioning every decision that they have. And so some, I'm, you know, the top, the answer to your question could probably take a whole day, but I think that one is understand where that tension is coming from, from the devs. Is it, uh, they missed the one meeting where everything became apparent? And some people made it and some people didn't, and therefore some people are way ahead. So maybe you could build better shared understanding. Are they scared about their craft in the sense that do they do they think they're never going to be able to go back and refactor this decision that they're going to be able to work on? Or are they lacking some important North Star context about the goal that you're trying to create? And then the final thing would be, you know. In some companies, you have such a culture of consensus that there's no bias to action. And so I think that that's where a product person can create a safe environment where they can say, let's time box this decision. We'll make it. And we might make the wrong decision 30% uh, of the time. But I think we can all agree here that a bias to action will move us forward in the right direction. So again, it's sort of about building a little bit about core principles about your team. So I don't know if that helps. I, I feel like I didn't do your question justice, but uh, those are some things I'm thinking about. Thank you. Any more questions from you guys? Any cool. I think that's, that's it. Um, yeah. thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining. I think it's lunchtime at your place now. Yeah, it's lunchtime. Um, okay. You know, connect with me on, I guess, Twitter or LinkedIn if you have some more questions. Um, I, thanks for the patience, too. You know, I, I, this is not the first, it's probably the third time I've tried to do the talking head presentation. So I'm a pretty physical person and walking around and whiteboards and all that kind of stuff. So it was a little awkward for me and hopefully that didn't make it uncomfortable for you guys. And then uh, I appreciate uh, your time and paying attention. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.